Hello, everyone. I'm Zhao Chuang. Today, let's get to know Jacques the Dinocheris. Dinocheris was a very mysterious animal. It was first discovered more than half a century ago. When people first discovered this animal, they only found a pair of fossilized hands. But unfortunately, for nearly half a century, people couldn't find out to whom this pair of fossilized hands belonged. It's said that it wasn't until the beginning of the 21st century that scientists returned to the excavation site and slowly figured out what this animal looked like. Other relatively complete specimens are said to be inspired by certain privately excavated fossils. I first knew about the overall appearance of Dinocheris in 2015. I had a chat with the late paleontologist Mr. Liu Junchang, who mentioned this animal. He described it as an animal with a dorsal sail and a head that resembled the Hadrosaurus. At that time, no official articles had been published. So, I only knew what this animal roughly looked like. And I drew a reconstruction picture, but it looked very different from the overall appearance of Dinocheris, as we know today. Nevertheless, I was still shocked at the time. Every time a discovery is made, people begin to imagine it based on a body part and picture, its overall appearance. And when you finally get to know what the animal looked like, it's like a revelation, unexpected yet everything falls into place. Dinocheris was such an example. Today, we know that Dinocheris was a huge animal, exceeding 10 meters in length. Some people speculate that it may even reach 11 or 12 meters. Among all the specimens of Dinocheris that have been found so far, two are the most complete, one being a smaller juvenile, the other being an adult. But the adult is not as complete as the juvenile. Based on the juvenile, we know what physical features that Dinocheris possessed, such as the back sail. Then we used the juvenile to infer what adults looked like, and figured out that adults could probably reach the size of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Dinocheris had a large head, which was very characteristic. It looked like that of Hadrosaurus, but they were not exactly the same. The tip of its mouth was widened. If viewed from above, its mouth looked like a duck's bill, with the far end bulging. Like the Hadrosaurus, it probably had a downward growing beak at the front end, an adaptation for feeding on things like aquatic plants. Its lower jaw was thicker and deeper, which could hold a lot of things in it enabling this animal to scoop up a lot at one time. So some people speculate that Dinocheris might prefer feeding on aquatic plants, small fish, or filter feeding. Because this wouldn't come as a surprise. For a long time, people thought that this group of animals, such as Ornithomimus lived on land, walking around in groups, but in recent years, with the discovery of relatively complete beak fossils of Ornithomimus, we know that its beak might resemble that of a flamingo, which was used for filter feeding. Many species of Ornithomimosaurs probably preferred to walk by the water. Their long legs might not be good at running on land, but they were good at wading in water as they looked for aquatic food. The same can probably be said for Dinocheris. Today we know that Dinocheris preferred to live by the water. They probably spent most of their time in the water, using their mouth to feed on fish or aquatic plants, because in the stomachs of Dinocheris, people found stomach stones. We generally associate stomach stones with herbivorous dinosaurs. They might use these stones to grind hard plant fibers. In addition, Fish scales have been found in the stomach of Dinocheris, indicating that this animal would probably eat fish too. Now, let's talk about the eyes. Its eyes were tiny, and it was hard to say whether its eyesight was good or not. Judging from its eyes alone, compared to many extant animals, small eyes may indicate poor eyesight. For example, modern rhinos or hippos have poor eyesight. But as an animal that was similar to birds, it's actually hard to tell. Although its eyes were small, they had complex structures such as the sclerotic ring, which could help Dinocheris see things far away. How small were its eyes? Dinocheris was more than 10 meters long. It had a gigantic body and a long skull. Its skull could exceed 1 meter, but its eyeballs were only about 8 centimeters in diameter. The sclerotic ring had an outer diameter of 8 centimeters and an inner diameter of only 3 to 4 centimeters. 
The eye size of extant animals, especially reptiles such as lizards, is equivalent to the size of the inner diameter. Therefore, based on the size of its sclerotic rings, we know that the eyes of Dinocheris might only be 3 to 4 centimeters, which were quite tiny. Its two nostrils were close together toward the middle. When Dinocheris was alive, its nostrils were likely to point upwards. This strange appearance probably indicates that this animal has adapted to aquatic life. It might look like a hippo, with its eyes located at atop its head. When in water, it could easily keep its eyes and nostrils above the surface at the same time. Currently, there are no fossils of the Dinocheris neck, but we can still speculate that its neck was likely to be bare. Because the temperature in Mongolia was very high at the time, such a large animal needed heat dissipation. The part that needed heat dissipation the most was its neck, which was likely to be bare, just like this model shows, and the rear part of the neck was sparsely covered with hair. In our reconstruction, the chest and belly of Dinocheris weren't covered with too much hair, which was based on the appearance of ostriches. With its huge size in mind, we left some bare skin on its chest and belly, mainly at the inner side of its arms. It might sometimes lie on the shore. For such a heavy animal, it might have some hair on the chest here, like an ostrich, so that it would protect its belly from rubbing against the ground. There was hair from the entire chest to the belly for protection. Between the hair, the most bulging part of the chest would be where the sternum or the two coracoids were located. There might be a hard pad around this area, which played a supporting role and would bear weight together with its hind limbs. After all, its four limbs were covered with soft feathers, and might not bear so much weight when it was resting. Therefore, the chest had to bear its body weight. So we covered this area with some short feathers and added a chest pad. It had an enormous body with an especially large pelvis. This caused it to have a big body cavity and belly. Therefore, although Dinocheris was an ornithomimosaur, it wasn't good at running as other members, and it probably walked very slowly on land. In addition, it had a tall dorsal sail, which we only found out in recent years. There are many theories on the function of the dorsal sail. Some people think that it might act like a camel's hump storing fat or water. However, for extant animals such as camels, their humps hardly need internal bones for support. If the hump is full, it will be erect. If it's depleted, it will droop to one side like a used leather bag. The fat storing part of many animals today doesn't need bones for support, so the theory that the dorsal sail functioned as a hump isn't convincing. Extant animals such as camels often store fat or water, but Dinocheris didn't need to store water, as it lived by the water where aquatic plants grew. Another theory is that the dorsal sail was for identification, which is quite convincing. As we know today, judging from the structure of its dorsal sail, its triangular shape wasn't likely to be completely wrapped in muscles, and the dorsal sail probably didn't have many functions. The dorsal sail might be partially covered with muscles, for example at the base, so that it could support its huge body, enabling it to move effortlessly, which makes sense. So in our reconstruction, we attach some muscles to the base of the dorsal sail, instead of filling the entire dorsal sail with muscles, and made its back look fuller, like that of an ox. Even toad ungulates such as oxen have a tall back, but their shoulder blades are also very tall. The same height allows the muscles to adjust and match the strength of its body, but Dinocheris was different. Its shoulder blades were narrow, and its pelvis was already thick enough to attach enough muscles, so the muscles did not need to connect to the back. Therefore, it's possible that the dorsal sail was just for identification. As a structure for identification, we are not sure about its color or what its surface looked like. Many scientists speculate that the skin might be bare, but we didn't adopt this view in our reconstruction because it wouldn't look harmonious. Instead, we covered it with feathers, which made it look like an ostrich's wings and tail with bright colors. In this way, we could achieve the same effect. Other scientists believe that its dorsal sail could be similar to that of Spinosaurus, which could maintain balance in the water like shark fins. We don't actually think so, because Dinocheris, although an aquatic animal, didn't look like a fast-swimming animal, so it probably didn't need a structure to maintain balance. 
At best, it would be submerged in water like a hippo, that's all. Dinocaris had a long tail. Based on the pigotile found at its tail tip, we speculate that its tail tip might be covered with long hair or feathers, forming a fan-like structure. In our reconstruction, we used feathers, and its wings were also covered with feathers. This is because, in Canada, people found a well-preserved fossil of an ornithomimus. Analysis of this fossil indicates that its body was partially covered with feathers, and the forelimbs were even covered with contour feathers. The so-called contour feathers are vein-like feathers that make up bird wings. Dinocaris might be the same. In terms of feather distribution, our reconstruction of Dinocaris was entirely based on the fossil of the Ornithomimus found in Canada, because that's the only evidence we can refer to at the moment. The fossil revealed that Ornithomimosaurs might have large feathers on their forelimbs and a bare neck. Its lower belly, lower hind limbs and the underside of its tail were probably bare as well. The upper part of its body was covered with feathers. The fossil didn't show what its tail looked like, but based on the pigotile and the fact that it had contour feathers, we speculate that Dinocaris might look like this. Its wings were reconstructed into a structure of a flightless dinosaur. For wing structures of this type of animal, we can refer to the Cordipteryx, which was a typical winged dinosaur. Winged dinosaurs running on land often had round or triangular wings. Feathers at the front part of the fingers were very short, which gradually became longer. This is the exact opposite of flying dinosaurs as well as many flying birds today. Flying birds often have long feathers, especially close to the hand, which form a very long triangle. Whereas for flightless dinosaurs, the triangle was located near the elbow, and the feathers here were normally longer. Our reconstruction of Dinocaris was, based on this theory, just like this model shows, for the Dinocaris, its huge claws would probably be very practical. When we were doing the reconstruction, we didn't make the rachises of its feathers very hard. Imagine an eagle with claws that had claws on its arms. When it uses its claws to do something, the feathers are likely to break. Tarbosaurus bite marks have been found on the shoulders of Dinocaris, indicating that Dinocaris probably used its front claws for fighting. Considering its huge size, we made the feathers on its wings and tail soft like those of an ostrich. It had three toes on each foot, and all three toes looked quite blunt at the tip, rather like hooves. The inner toe was slightly stronger, so this toe was made bigger, which looked like a hoof adapted for walking. Its two legs were thick and strong. Dinocaris wasn't good at running fast, but it could bear its huge body weight, and the hind limbs looked really bulky. Good, the above concludes our introduction to Jacques, the Dinocaris. Thank you all.